The Columbia River is the largest river in the Pacific Northwest. Its water starts high in the Rocky Mountains of British Columbia at an elevation of 2,690 feet. During the 1,243 mile journey towards the Pacific Ocean, the Columbia River's largest contributor is the Snake River. Their combined forces flow an average of 265,000 cubic feet of water per second, making this the largest drainage of any North American river going into the Pacific Ocean. The Columbia River Bar is a system of bars and shoals that connect the Columbia River with the Pacific Ocean. The Columbia River Bar spans approximately three miles wide and six miles long. The Columbia River was originally referred to as the San Rogue. It is a mecca for fishermen and outdoor enthusiasts alike. It is beautiful and picturesque, but at the same time, it can be a wolf in sheep's clothing. indigenous boat sailed into the Columbia River in the late 1700s. Over the following decades, fur trading companies used the Columbia River as a key transportation route, but it came at a heavy cost. The Columbia River Bar is said to have sunk over 2,000 boats and sadly claimed over 1,200 lives. And while the Columbia River is still considered some of the most treacherous water in the entire world, there are some things that are helping to make it safer. And one of those things is technology. See, in the early days, you think about a guy that was standing on the front of those ships with a long rope and a piece of iron attached that would continually be lifting and bumping bottom with that iron and then gauging the depth of the water by the knots in his rope. That is how they would take readings of how deep water they were in. Now, what do we do? We push a button on a fish finder. As far as education goes, think about it like this. A lot of the hazards on the river have been figured out literally to the point of being predictable. In fact, in my opinion, a lot of the problems they used to run into were they didn't understand the tides. They didn't know if they started their way into that river, if the tide was gonna pull them in, if it was gonna push them back out. They really didn't understand what tides they needed to avoid. Here are the topics that the rest of the video is going to cover. Got a new boat, and some of you have probably seen my video I made about that. And what happened is, as I got a more capable boat, it allowed me to start opening up the horizon to a number of different styles of fishing, such as albacore tuna, halibut, some of the things that required crossing the bar and going farther offshore. One of my insecurities was crossing the bar. I know it's really dangerous. I understood that there's a lot of, a lot of things I didn't know about it. And so I really started looking about how can I educate myself to make my bar crossings safer. But as I started researching, maybe some of you share the same issue that I do, Research quickly becomes an obsession. And I started obsessing about this. And I started compiling as much as I could, and I've tried to put it together in one place for you to view it and for you to see it and hopefully learn a thing or two. And those of you that have seen my videos before, you know, what inspires me to do a video like this 
is when there's something that I think is beneficial or could help and I'm looking for it and can't find it. When I see that, I, I try to do my own research. I try to compile as much as I can. And then that's something that intrigues me to make one of these videos. So that's what we're doing here. I don't monetize these videos. I don't clutter them with ads. Uh, I'm not e I don't even, I'm not one of those guys that tells you, hey, like this video or bump subscribe or smash like or whatever all these other YouTubers are doing. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. That's why they're doing it. That's just not what my goal was with these videos. These videos are designed to help people that are in a similar position as I was and I hope it's appreciated to some level. In a perfect world, maybe someday I'll end up with a sponsorship out of this. Some of the safety items that we're gonna talk about are required by law for voting in the state that you live in. I recommend looking at all the requirements and then also looking at anything you can have in addition to those requirements that might be helpful or useful in case of an emergency. You should have plenty of life jackets and it's your responsibility to not only wear one, but to also make sure that your crew and your passengers also are wearing theirs. I always wear a CO2 inflatable. However, sometimes right before I cross a bar, I'll switch over to a float coat and that just kind of helps me reset and get in the zone for the bar crossing. radio has a lot of advantages i think it's a good idea to have a backup because what if your emergency is electrical you're still going to have your handheld heaven forbid if you did end up in the water your handheld could be in your ditch bag the they float they're waterproof most of them and a couple hundred dollars will buy you a very nice handheld tip for you is make sure that also in your ditch bag you have a Ziploc bag full of extra batteries. Here in Oregon it is required to have a throwable device. My suggestion is make sure that you have a good floating rope attached to that throwable device. Otherwise if you ever get in an emergency and need to use it you'd only have one chance, one shot. And you think about it like this. If somebody's in the water and you throw that device and miss, if you're in current or if there's wind, that throwable device is going to float away probably faster than they can swim to it, especially if they're hypothermic or exhausted. So make sure that you do have a good floating rope. 
And the reality of the situation is most times you would need that throwable device is when in rough weather. So it may take multiple attempts. The rope allows you to do that. Now the floating rope also is something that for lack of a better term, if they were to get tangled up in, then you could pull that rope back until they're able to grab a hold of the throw the throwable device. The bottom line is this. It's easier to throw a device or throw a rope than it is to steer a boat in rough conditions. And again, that's when most accidents happen. On my boat, I have multiple throw devices and I'll tell you why. Those little square foam cushions that they sell for a throwable device, they make great seat cushions. So when we're fishing on the back of my boat and it has the little metal fold down chairs, those little throwable devices make a good inexpensive seat cushion that also is another device that you could use in an emergency. My boat has a built-in ladder on the offshore bracket. However, if I didn't have one, I would suggest an inexpensive ladder that's basically a rope and plastic ladder. I know a lot of different places sell them, but that can be rolled up and just stowed away in your gunnel on the side. If somebody's in the water, especially if they're hypothermic or exhausted and they have low strength, You've got to think, could you lift that person over the side of your boat and get them in, in rough conditions? Sometimes just getting a big fish and a net over the side into the boat is tough. An anchor and rope may save you from catastrophe if you lost all power. Attach to the bow of your boat and let out. At least that anchor and rope is going to keep your nose towards the current. In fact, I recommend that if you are going offshore or into the deeper waters in the ocean, you should have a parachute style anchor. They are called sea anchors. Again, in case you lose power, those parachute style anchors will at least keep your nose to, into the wind or into the currents. So you're not taking waves over the stern of your boat and so you're not getting hit from the side. Float plans. We all know you should, but do you? And if not, you should start. In fact, here's a website where you can go and print one off and then every time you leave, just fill that out and leave with somebody home. If for any reason you don't show back up at port at the expected time, at least you know somebody's looking out for you. Uh, also, the Coast Guard has made this a whole lot easier for us. They actually have an app that looks like this. You can click on the side button and pull up a float plan. You can put in all your information and save it so you don't have to do that every single time. All you need to do is come in, update the dates, the things like that, and right from that app, you can then text that or email it to somebody and there's your solution to a simple and easy way to have a float plan. All right, so the following items that I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna have listed as optional safety items. However, I would tell you to very strongly consider these if you're going offshore. I, in fact, every picture that you've seen throughout this safety equipment is actual photos from the equipment from my boat. I personally have spent my hard earned money to buy these items. I hope I never have to use them. I hope you never have to use them, but we'd all be a lot happier knowing we had them and didn't need them, then not have them when we need them. All of you concealed carry guys and gals are giving me a high five right now, I know it. Okay, so realize with these life rafts, they will self deploy. However, if your boat is capsizing and is going underwater, 
they will automatically deploy. If you have to do it manually, what you need to remember is that these life rafts have what's called a painter line. And that's the rope that is attached to the boat and goes to the raft. So if you throw that raft in, you're gonna have to start pulling that painter line. Mine is 40 feet. So you've gotta get all the way to the end, pull it out, kaboom, that life raft is gonna open up and deploy. Now, the grave mistake that has been made by people in the past is you do not, and I repeat this, you do not cut that painter line until everybody's in the, in the life raft. What's happened in the past is people have literally got in there and they've cut that off thinking that they're just gonna stay there floating while the other people board. Well, realize that these life rafts sit right on the top of the water. If there's any wind and they're lightweight, they're gonna push away. There are horrific stories of people that cut the line too soon and the people in the water could not catch up. So you need to make sure that everybody's in. Now, most of these life rafts are gonna have a knife right at the edge where the painter line connects. It's gonna be usually in a little Velcro pouch. Pull that out, cut the line if you need to. Most boats now, I believe most boats built after 1978, uh, will mostly stay afloat. Even if they capsize, even if they're on their side or upside down, a lot of them will stay afloat. Uh, in fact, the Coast Guard says the average boat sinking takes between 15 and 30 minutes. Now, I, my personal opinion says where we're at, we're in a different scenario there. Obviously, if you're crossing the Columbia River bar and getting bashed with waves, I don't picture a boat taking 15 to 30 minutes. It's usually gonna be a lot faster. But understand that if you're out at sea and that life raft needs to be deployed, leave it connected to the boat as long as you possibly can and then cut it loose. Remember that a life raft will keep you afloat, but it will not tell anybody about your emergency and it will not tell them exactly where you are. An EPIRB will. So there's a number of different EPIRBs on the market. Mine is one that will self-deploy if it hits water or submerged, or you can open the hatch, take it out, and you can either flip the little latch and press the red button that indicates an emergency, or if you throw it in the water or if it touches water, they have, I believe, two metal probes that are connected by water when submerged and that will also send out the signal. These things are not cheap. However, they are very accurate. I A PLB has very similar benefits to the EPIRB, only smaller. It can be secured right onto your life jacket. So for those of you that fish with other people, this is something that you can always have with you and on you. When you go fishing with somebody else, take your own life jacket and have your own PLB already attached. The ditch bag is where I keep most of my legally required safety equipment, such as flares, whistles. This is also where I keep my handheld VHF. And one thing that I recommend with the flares, as we all know, they have to be up to date. You have to replace your flares every couple or a few years, depending on your state's requirements. But don't throw out your old flares. I keep all my old ones in there. Doesn't mean you have to get expired flares out of your boat. It just means you have to have some new ones in it. If I was in a situation and I had old flares, I'd be firing them off as quick as I can load them up. So keep the old ones for that. At this point, I might seem like overkill to some of you, but I will tell you, I also carry a Wego. There's a number of different brands that make these, but what it is, it's a dead battery jump starter. And I honestly do not really carry this for the purpose of my boat because I have newer batteries and I'm pretty meticulous about making sure they're charged and healthy. However, I carry this Wego because I think, what if I needed to assist somebody else? Some people are gonna say, well, why would I spend money on something like that? If it's their problem, it's their problem. Mariner code shouldn't work like that. If you're there and somebody needs assistance, you should help them. 
If it was as simple as a dead battery, I would much rather let them take a crack at this Wego than me have to tow them in. Some of the other benefits of these units is they charge cell phones and they've got a very powerful flashlight. And the flashlight does have uh, different patterns that it will send out for different emergencies, things like that. And supposedly they will hold a charge for a year. That doesn't mean you could use it for a year, but sitting there in your boat under a seat will stay charged for up to a year. And I think it's a good idea to have. There is no law that requires you to have a radar. But let's be clear, Buoy 10 is one of the foggiest places in the entire country. I look at it like, how would you like to be out there fogged in on the river or in the bar or just outside on the ocean and hear foghorns from a large ship that you could not see? What would you give for a radar at that point? If you do have a radar, get out there and test it and get familiar with how it works. One of the guys on the iFish forum says it the best. He says, out in the water, in a situation, is no time to have to read an owner's manual. You should do that before you need it. You should test your equipment before you need it, and you should know how it's gonna work before you actually need it. I believe every captain should have a compass and at least basic knowledge on how to use it. I always like to have not only a compass, I like to have paper charts on my boat as a little backup. Both items are relatively small, but both items can be very handy. But yet again, understand the basics of how to use them. While the entire Buoy 10 estuary can be considered dangerous, we are going to focus on a few specific areas. A lot of you have probably seen this map circulating around. Coast Guard gives it out at a lot of different events and things like that. We're going to break this down and not only talk about a few of these areas, but I'm going to show you what they actually look like in person. Are the Chinook Spurs. These are old pilings that come up. People recreate around them. As you can see, there's a boat out there crabbing in the back. If you were to lose power and get pushed into those pilings, there's a very high likelihood you're gonna get capsized. So that right over there is the infamous flats up spit. And today it's relatively calm. It's still pretty gnarly. This is Jetty A. Jetty A can present a number of different problems specifically for smaller or slower boats. It's not uncommon for currents to come off the tip of Jetty A at eight knots, which for a small or slower boat, if that's unexpected, it's gonna be really hard for them to fight against that current. This is the Peacock Spit. Make no bones about it, Peacock Spit is a death trap. Peacock Spit has claimed more boats and more lives than probably any other area down here. This is the Peacock Spit. Behind me is buoy 11. And if you look over here in the background, you've got the Cape Disappointment Lighthouse. The Waco is gonna be over here. Just right here, this section is referred to as the middle ground. Middle ground can be dangerous because it's really shallow. It's also really good for crabbing. And uh, so a lot of people recreate there, but you definitely gotta be careful.
So with all these dangerous areas, we have now narrowed down the path to the main channel. These ships have the right of way. You can monitor channel 13 on your VHF radio to see what the big ships are doing. I also like their website. I watch it from time to time. This is not something practical to use while you're on the water, but if you ever like to see where the ships are coming from or where they're going, it's kind of cool. And here's their website. Okay, so here is one of the hardest parts of being a captain. Responsibility. Go and no-go decisions. And what it boils down to is a go or no-go decision when the weather stops us from doing what we want to do, which is being on the water or in the ocean. You are going to hear me use the word you several times because there is a level of accountability that needs to be understood here. And so uh, let's dive into this. Guys, as a captain, it is your responsibility to determine if it's safe for you to go out or not. Um, nobody knows your skills behind the wheel of your boat better than you do. So you have to be the one that makes the decision of whether it's safe to go out or not. Where that becomes a challenge is when we have the influence of people that come to go fishing with us and they really want to go out, but we as captains have to decide whether that should happen or whether it shouldn't. And I, look guys, I realize this is a difficult one. I think a lot of us out here on the coast have a lot of family members or friends that come out once a year for their vacation, go out fishing for a couple of days. They've saved money, they've taken time off of work, they've done everything they can to come out here and go fish. But if the weather doesn't say it's okay to be on that ocean, you should not force it. See, the reality is, a lot of times when somebody comes out here, they really wanna influence you into going. You might hear the ocean's really good or you wanna go out for albacore instead of salmon. And so a lot of times people really just wanna press it. In fact, one time I had somebody tell me, we, we were on a 20, 26 foot restriction on the bar. And I had somebody telling me, well, Joel, technically your boat's over 26 because it's 26. Then you've got the offshore bracket and the motor. So you're actually a few feet over. I'm not gonna go out and cross a bar on 26 foot restriction because legally it, it's okay. Guys, what you've got to remember is a lot of times people especially our guests they come out they're excited they're making emotional decisions you should never base a decision on emotions you should base your decisions on logic if the logical explanation is that the bar is too rough or the ocean condition is too rough don't go for it guys that you've got to realize there's more to a no-go decision than just safety You've got to also factor in, is it going to be fun? The ocean might not kill you on a five foot swell five seconds apart, but guess what? It's not going to be fun to fish it. So you've got to make up that decision. And the other thing to remember here is the river is great. You guys, we have world class salmon fishing in the Columbia River. So you've got to look at it and say, if we can't go out to the ocean, we all know the ocean can be fast and furious, but heck, what's the worst case scenario? World-class fishing in the Columbia River? Let's go over four factors that would help determine our go or no-go decision. In 
my opinion, wind is the biggest factor here. So you can go to Google and type in Beaufort chart, B-E-A-U-F-O-R-T. And that'll pull up a chart. Now you can be more specific and pull up Beaufort chart for ocean conditions. And it'll show you how the wind is expected to affect the waves and the swell. I don't think it's 100% accurate, but what I suggest you do is make a log. On one side of the log, write down what the conditions are forecasted to be. And then when you go out there and you get back, jot down what they actually were and start forming a little bit of a pattern of how they compare. And that way you can kind of understand how much chop is expected to be on the ocean under certain conditions. If I see thunder or lightning on the forecast, I'm not going. I also believe you should learn about clouds, what clouds are harmless and what clouds pot pose potential threats. The upcoming forecast is a big part of a go or no go decision. In fact, there's something I refer to as a fool's window. This example that I am gonna show you is a little bit extreme, but I wanna give you a pronounced visual of what I actually mean by this. So let's look at three days. If we've got a Friday, Saturday, and a Sunday, as you see, fr Friday and Sunday are both really bad conditions. Saturday looks okay. By itself, Saturday seems okay, but when it's sandwiched in between Friday and Sunday, now it poses a potential threat. See, think about it like this. How often is the weather forecast inaccurate? Quite a bit. And so we see a lot of times where people say, well, those that middle day Saturday looks fine. It should be okay. But if you get out there 30 or 40 miles for albacore and that storm decides to move in a little bit sooner, you've got a situation on your hands. That's why I refer to this as a fool's window. In regards to ocean conditions, a lot of people look at the size of the swell and that's it. It goes a lot deeper than that. So let's look at three important factors that we should always assess. You obviously should always look at the size of the swell, but you then need to factor the wind chop on top of that. Example, if you've got a five foot swell but then an added two foot of wind chop, you've got a combined sea of seven feet. How far apart are the swells? You'll hear this referred to as seconds apart. That's something that I'll be talking about in just a moment. The direction of the swells is an important factor. Off the Columbia River, we all dread the south winds. South winds can be a little unpredictable. They can also build up some pretty good swells on the water and the wind direction is gonna be a big factor. Example, if I go, if I'm going out tuna fishing and we're getting a northwest swell, most likely in the morning, I'm gonna go slightly north because I'd rather combat some of those swells on the way out than when we're done at the end of the day and we're tired and ready to go in, then I can have those swells and those winds to my back to help kind of push me in. In this forecast on the left, we see the wind with a potential gust. On the right of that, we see our swells at about 6.3 feet and below it in the small numbers, you see the seconds apart. Let's understand how that works. If we look at our swells, we might have a five foot swell. If you hear it listed as five foot swell at four seconds apart, here is what that means. That is a five foot swell happening every four seconds. This, you might have the same five foot swell, but if it's 10 seconds apart, it's gonna be a lot smoother wave. It's gonna be more of a rounded wave. Whereas the example on top, 
These are steep. These are choppy. This could be a sloppy ocean. Then we look at this example on the right. We've got softer winds. We've got smaller seas. Here's what I would make out of these two forecasts. Let's look at the tides. There are two major things that I look at in regards to the tides. One, I look at the size of the exchange. And second, I look at the times of the exchange. Let's look at the size of the exchange and what this means. From the bottom of this tide right here to the top of this swell, there's only about a three foot difference. This is what we call a soft exchange. While the one on the right, this tide is a beast. If we look at this tide from the top to the bottom, you're gonna see about an eight and a half foot exchange. So why does this matter? Because the time of the, the tide takes to shift is always going to be the same, about six hours. On this example on the right means it's gonna be a whole lot more water in the same amount of time. Do you remember when we talked about the Columbia River flowing an average of 265,000 cubic feet of water per second. The tide as it rises basically creates a dam for all this moving water. As it's pushing water from the ocean in, it's also stopping the river currents from going out. That water starts backing up, up the Columbia River, backs up almost 100 miles. Now, when the tide shifts and starts to fall, all of that water that has piled up is now going to start flowing out. We call this the ebb tide. This time creates the most current, the worst possible conditions on the Columbia River bar. This is when the water is pushing out so hard, it compresses those ocean swells, kind of like an accordion, so your swells get steeper, they get tighter together, and you're also fighting the currents There is something talked about for factoring the currents of the flow, and it's called the rule of 12. Here's what that means. From the top of the tide until the bottom of the tide, we already realize it's going to take about six hours. During that six hours, here is how the current is expected to flow. In the first hour, we're gonna see about 1 12th of that backed up water start moving out. So that tide was coming in, it then started to shift, and now it's slowly gonna start turning around and making momentum out. In that first hour, about 1 12th of the water is going to flow. In the second hour, it's gonna start speeding up, it's gonna start building a little momentum, in that second hour, we'll see about two twelfth of the water flow out, which leads us to what is considered the most dangerous part of the tide on the Columbia River bar. And that is that middle two hours, the third and fourth hour after high water. That does not mean the other times are not dangerous, that any ebb tide should be considered dangerous and should be avoided. However, these middle two hours are by far the most notorious currents and hazardous conditions on the Columbia River bar. After that fourth hour, then it starts to settle down. It starts to slow a little bit and you'll see two twelfth in the fifth hour, about one twelfth in the sixth, and then the tide will shift and start doing it all over again.
First things first, just remember if you are going out, you still need to come back in. Let's look at why the times of the exchange matter. I will show you two examples. So let's look at this, which is better? I'm gonna just cut right through the chase and tell you, I would take example two every time in this scenario. Let's break down some of the reasons why that example is better than the first. Starting off, let's look at our daylight hours. Example number two, daylight starts when? While the tide is still rising. When do we want to cross the bar? Preferably on a rising or incoming tide. When does that tide happen? First thing in the morning. As fishermen, when do we like to fish? First thing in the morning. But let's also look at when that tide is dropped. We've obviously already identified it's a small exchange, so there's not gonna be as much fast current flowing. That's a benefit. And look at when the second incoming starts, around 2 p.m. At the Buoy 10 Estuary, we are, it's well known and it's well documented that we get a pretty good afternoon breeze. That 2 p.m. bar crossing could help us get off the ocean before those notorious winds start. And then look at the end of our daylight. When that sun starts to set and starts to go down, we're still on an incoming tide. So for those of you that are diehard and want to fish all day, you could fish until your heart's content and still run in and cross that bar on an incoming swell. Now let's talk about some of the hazards of example number one. First and foremost, we can see this is a huge exchange. These are gonna be heavy, nasty currents. Also, it gets dark before the river is done ebbing. So what happens is people will go out there and start fishing, let's say you're out tuna fishing and the bite is on or you miscalculate how long it's gonna take to get back. Now you come in and you're crossing the bar either on an ebb tide or you're stuck waiting for the ebb to stop. Well, that ebb's not gonna stop while there's still daylight. So now you're either gonna be crossing the bar in the dark which is hazardous, or you're gonna be crossing the bar during the ebb tide, which is hazardous. Either way, you're in a bad situation. See, guys, a lot of times people get out there and they make bad decisions, again, based on emotion. They've gone out there, they're excited about catching fish, or they're one fish, two fish short of a limit, and so they keep fishing and they think, Oh, we'll be fine if we hurry back. Well, conditions don't always allow you to hurry back. Either way, this one's tough. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you do get stuck in a situation like this, sometimes you have to wait it out. Sometimes you will have to sit there and wait for the tides to shift. If so, you need to have plenty of fuel on your boat. You should never be cutting it tight on getting out to the tuna grounds or whatever and getting back because what if you got stuck sitting there literally all night? What if you had to wait till the next exchange in the morning? You better have enough fuel to keep your boat nosed into those currents. to give you a reason not to take risks like this. You guys, fishing the river on a big exchange like this can be really good. In fact, sometimes on these big tide exchanges, that's when we get a tremendous amount of push for new fish to come from just outside in the ocean into the river. Some of your big coho days will come with some of these large exchanges. These big swings in the tide push a lot of bait, they push a lot of fish in, 
and the river fishing on these days could be phenomenal. Let's look at some other conditions that might force a no-go decision. As a general rule of thumb, if the combination of the ocean swells and the wind waves exceed the seconds apart, stay home or fish the river. I don't like to be in winds much over 12 to 14 knots. That does not mean that it will kill you, but that's where I believe the fun stops. Wind, everyone has their comfort level, but it's up to you to gauge where yours is at. That might be determined by comfort level, that might be determined by the size of your boat, or what you actually will or will not have fun fishing in. I typically avoid seas over five to six feet. But if the swells are not close, if the seconds apart are adequate, and there's no wind, I might handle a little larger swells. Bar restrictions are a big maybe. If there is a 16 foot restriction and the reports seem reasonable, I will personally take my 20 foot, 28 foot boat across it. If I hear there's a 26 foot restriction, I'm not going. Also consider what the changes might be. Are the tides and weather projected to get better or worse? Tides change six hours apart. There will usually be two highs per day. However, they are not always the same size. So if you're crossing earlier on the smaller exchange, if you plan on crossing later on the bigger exchange, expect that the conditions might be a little more extreme than the first one. And also look at what is the weather going to do? Is the weather going to clear up from where it's currently at? Or is the weather conditions going to deteriorate? That is all going to affect the bar. And that's going to affect our decisions. So if there's a bar restriction, for me, it's a big maybe. I don't know if I can say this strong enough. Just because there is a restriction that says nothing less than 26 or 20, or 16, or 40, or whatever the number is, just because it is restricted below that does not mean everything above it is okay. Understand the restrictions and, and the conditions are not updated to the minute. There's so many factors that go into that on your part of making the decision. I've seen some captains that operate a 18 or 20 foot a luma weld better than some captains operate a 40 foot fiberglass. I'm going to give you some websites and apps that I personally use for finding out our conditions. I am sure we could go to Google and find a list of hundreds and I'm sure some of you have your favorites. I'm not going to talk about all of these websites. I'm just going to talk about a few of them and then you should go do some due diligence and also find some ones that you like and prefer. And in fact, if you want to throw some of those in the comments down below, that would be great. Windfinder.com is my favorite. It's my favorite website. It's my favorite app. I typically watch the Astoria West buoy when I'm going out albacore fishing. And I also watch the NOAA website, that one is listed right here, NOAA.gov, and it will show you the bar closures and restrictions. Again, we're going to want to verify that over the radio, but that will give you an idea before you leave your house 
if there are restrictions or what the restrictions are. Tidesnear.me is great because this one actually shows you the slack tide, which is an interesting point to make. See, when you look at a tide, there's a lot of people that have a misconception. A lot of people think high tide is when the tide has raised all the way up and now it's slack, it's not moving. That's incorrect. High tide is water aggressively pushing in towards the river. Slack tide is when it stops pushing in and goes flat like a lake before it starts moving out. Usually about an hour or an hour and a half later. So let's take a look at some of these apps. One of them that I like is the NOAA weather app. You can go in there and pin your areas where you fish the most often, and then you can click on those pins. It'll show you the forecast, and you can see the weather specific to that area. Fish weather app is a great one. It looks like this. And what we want to see when we go in these apps, we're specifically looking for three things. We want to see that they show wind. We want to see the wave height and the seconds apart. Apps have it. Yes, there's our wind. There is our wave height. And right here is our seconds apart. My favorite app out of all of them is called WindFinder. It has a map that shows the wind. It also has the forecast right here. Now, does this have our three things we're looking for? There's our wind. Here is our wave height. And there is our seconds apart. Part of what makes the Columbia River bar so unpredictable is the fact that there can literally be potential for currents coming from multiple directions at the same time. And that is why it is so important to continue educating yourself and continue growing your skills with your own boat. See, this video is not designed to be the end all be all. You should continue to learn. You should continue to understand the bar, the conditions, the river, and how all that works with the skills that you have. I'm gonna show you some ways to continue learning Chapman, Piloting, and Seamanship. This book has it all. It's over 800 pages. This book covers everything from techniques all the way to bilge pumps, and everything in between. Uh, in fact, this book, if you ever have a friend or a family member that is impossible to shop for, get them this book. It's really good. In a perfect world, you find an experienced captain that will take you out and show you the ropes. In my personal experience, that is easier said than done. In some cases, it might be worthwhile to take a few guided trips with an experienced captain. You might have to spend a little bit of money, but that education might really pay off. Plus, you get a fishing trip with it. There are a lot of fishing forums out there. My favorite two are ifish.net and bdoutdoors.com. These forum groups can be great, can also be overwhelming. So as a lot of you know, as you start getting on some of the fishing forums, you can ask for advice. But the advice at times, there's a lot of differing opinions on how things work. Um, quite frankly, there's just some people there that are gonna troll it and make uh, a mountain out of a molehill and just basically complicate and make things worse for you. I always say, watch out who you take your advice from. Sometimes you have no idea who that person is that's on the other side of that computer screen they may not have real world experience. And the other thing to remember 
is that not everybody's on the same playing field or on the same level with their boating skills. You might have ask somebody advice and you might talk to a complete amateur that is way too cautious for the skill level that you are personally on. And then it also goes the other way around. You might ask somebody about a bar crossing and you might be talking to somebody that's crossed a thousand times and understands it very thoroughly. They may not be able to identify with your beginning skill level. So it really does go both directions. Watch out who you take your advice from. Some of the trusted sources are obviously the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard has a really good website, especially for the basics and safety. However, you do need to remember a lot of the things they talk about on their website are nationwide. And we have a unique situation with our waters here. We have a stretch of water that is completely unique and so you need to understand that in my opinion the very best website you can find for our fishery and dealing with the columbia river and the pacific ocean is called leroysramblings.com in a few minutes when we talk about some of the bar crossings and currents and things like that I am going to use several quotes from his website. I thank him for the permission to do so. I think he has the very best breakdown of what we deal with in our waters. Let's talk about some things we should do before crossing any bar, coming in or going out. First and foremost, life jackets on. When I see people cross a bar without wearing a life jacket, I think to myself, why do you even have them? This is what you have them for. If not now, when? All right, start. Time. <laughs> I stopped How long? <laughs> Three seconds. Okay, so here's what I hate hearing. Some people say, well, if you can put a life jacket on that fast, well, I could just put it on if we see something hazardous happening. Guys, that's like saying, I don't wear my seatbelt unless I see a car coming. It doesn't work that way. Put your life jackets on. Coast Guard, can I get a Columbia River bar report, please? An empty five gallon bucket banging around in the back of a boat in rough conditions sounds like all hell breaking loose. Your crew should be paying attention. Now here goes the toughest one of them all. No fishing stories. I love fishing. I live for it. It is my favorite thing to do, but I don't give a shit about it when I'm crossing the bar. What should your crew be doing? First and foremost, they should have their eyes open for crab pots. Crab pots are the landmines of the ocean. You wrap a rope around your prop from a crab pot and you could be in trouble. And these things are everywhere. They drift around, they get in the channel, they are everywhere. Your crew should help you be eyes for that. How about watching out for following seas? We're gonna be talking about some of the dangers of following seas and that you never wanna let them overtake your boat if possible. But you've gotta realize, boats don't have rear view mirrors. Let your crew help you here. Crossing the bar going out can and most likely will be an entirely different situation than coming in. You should always try to have an idea of what the conditions are going to be. However, never expect them to be 100% accurate. 
We are always going to do our research before we go. We've spent a good time talking about that today. But never expect it to be exactly what you envision. A good captain is always going to be able to shift on the fly. From the river looking out, you will always be able to see white caps better than when you're in the ocean looking in. So pay attention as you approach buoy 10. If you decide to cross, you should be very certain of your decision, as turning around on a rough bar can be a horrible decision. Taking a wave broadside can be catastrophic, and even if you were to get turned around, then you're encountered with a following sea that in my opinion is more dangerous than head on. For the purpose of this video, here is what a very small swell looks like against the side of a 28 foot, three ton boat. Ocean swells generate and maintain a lot more power than a wind wave or a chop caused by other boats. And that's why you never want to take them broadside. Imagine what a six or eight foot swell would do. Sometimes the swells can be very large and look really intimidating. That's when you need to maintain proper speed control. When things get rough, a lot of times your adrenaline starts going and you just want to be out of the bar as soon as possible. Sometimes that's when you get too eager and your speeds go too high. That just intensifies the already bad situation. You need to slow down and ride the waves like a duck. Give your boat just enough power to climb to the top, but not enough to jump over or smash down on the other side of the crest. Most people prefer to run the red line out. Typically we'll try to run the red line out until we can get past the south jetty which is marked 2SJ on the map you're seeing. With this route, beware of cutting straight from the 12 and definitely not from the 14, but be aware of cutting straight across from the 12 to the six. A lot of people will try to do that, but you are gonna run into some shallow water. I personally prefer to go to the 10 and sometimes even the eight before going uh, towards the six. But if you do cut across there, just be aware that it can be a little shallow. Now, as you're approaching buoy six, make sure that you're not mistaking buoy six with the two SJ. Again, there's a lot of turbulence off that broken tip of the south jetty. I'm gonna show you a photo of that. Um, so you need to stay clear of it. It does get really shallow, obviously to the point of part of it sticks out of water. So a lot of people on the iFish forum were asking me about addressing what routes to take under different conditions. Most of the advice that I'm gonna give you from there comes directly from Leroy's Ramblings. And I put an animation with them, so I'm gonna actually kind of play those slides and let you read some quotes from his website and let the animations walk you through the routes we would take for those specific conditions. the south side but don't run much south of the red buoy line until you get past buoy 12. After 12 you can pretty much cut to the tip of the south jetty. The jetty extends underwater from the tip of the visible jetty out to buoy 2SJ. Gets about 10 foot depth at the low tide near the visible tip. I would stay at least 100 yards west of the tip if running out there can be pretty good rip that develops right on top of the sunken jetty that you have to slow down to get across, but once across, smooth sailing. This can many times cut several miles of a lumpy bar cross. A west swell is gonna be very similar to a southwest swell. The main difference is with this one, you may need to zigzag a little bit. While you're trying to go south, 
you're gonna continue to have waves and swells coming straight from the west. And so you may have to zigzag a little bit to work your ground south without taking the wave broadside like we talked about before. Your guide here is the South or Red Buoy Line. Stay with them until you get past Buoy 8 or so. By the time you get to Buoy 10, you can make a decision where to get across the South Jetty by looking toward the tip of the jetty. If you see them rolling and breaking, don't go there. Continue down the red line until you get past the breakers. Ultimately, south of the South Jetty is the smoothest, but getting there can be tough at times. Running the green line should be avoided in most cases. The only exception is typically the northwest swells. Now, if you do run the green line, please understand how dangerous the peacock spit can be. Make sure you go plenty around it. I typically don't cut across until I'm between seven and three in about 40 feet of water. The north side can be very dangerous and unpredictable, plus very rough, whilst just several miles south of the CR buoy it can be flat. One of the reasons for this is that the current flows north, into the swells and often into the northwest wind. On the north side and the flows south on the south side, Peacock Spit on the north can be very dangerous and claims a lot of boats each year. The skippers get complacent. Crossing the bar coming in is more dangerous than going out, in my opinion. You deal with an entirely different set of situations. This is the time to be on your game. When I get done tuna fishing and I'm gonna start my journey back towards the bar, I typically will have an energy drink or a cup of coffee or something that can start kicking in for when I get there closer to that bar. People tend to make bad decisions when coming back in. Why? Because you've been out fishing all day. You might've got up early. You went out all day. You're tired. You just want to get back. And that is what can lead towards a bad decision. The worst case scenario that I've seen is when somebody gets seasick. If you're out there on the ocean and you've got a passenger that is seasick, and feeling miserable, you get back to the start of the bar and it's not the right time to cross, you are more likely to make a bad choice because of the intensity of that seasick person. Remember, seasickness is not going to kill them. They're gonna wish it did, but seasickness is not going to kill them. The bar could you will not be able to see white caps as well from the ocean looking towards the river as you could when you were coming out. Why? Because from the front, you can see the breakers, you can see the, the white caps folding. From the ocean, it may look smooth, they may look rounded. In fact, a lot of times I've heard people say, there was no white caps when I started across the bar, but then I saw a bunch of them forming behind me once we got into it. Well, the reality of the situation is those white caps were probably already there. However, they didn't know it until they got on that side of them. So you need to look out for white water. You need to look for some of the foam and the bubbles on the surface that follow after the white caps. At times, you can go off to the side of the bar, just off the south jetty, and look across. If you look across from the side and you see rollers and white caps, you just might need to wait it out. As fishermen, we all like our catchy sayings. Here's one of mine. When in doubt, wait it out. It's not if the conditions will change, it is when they will change. If you do get stuck waiting for a change in the tides, the common recommendation you'll receive is go off the south jetty, maintain an adequate depth, keep your nose pointed into the swells, and wait it out. That's kind of your area of sanctuary, so to speak. Understand the challenges those breakers can bring. 
Not only can they crush over the side or stern or anywhere of your boat, they also can run a lot of problems on the performance of your motor. In fact, I've heard people say, I've never had problems with this motor ever until I started crossing the bar in rough conditions and then my motor started skipping on me. Guys, what that likely was, was they were hitting white water, they were hitting some of that foamy or aerated water and their prop was cavitating. Their prop was spinning, their RPMs were going crazy, then it'd catch heavy water again and so it felt like it was skipping, but that might have been caused by, again, the prop cavitating in the looser water. Here is a good quote to explain the actions coming in. Some boaters will get on the backside and have enough power to stay there and ride the wave basically all the way across. This can work, it's a very smooth ride, but be aware that if something goes wrong it will happen very fast these waves are doing in excess of 30 miles per hour i'm going to show you an example it's going to be on a tiny swell however it will show you kind of the principle of what we're looking to do so if you see that swell forming in front of us just like that just like that, we want to stay on the back side of that swell. What you don't want to do, and that one kind of broke up on us, but what you don't want to do is try to go over top of that swell because then it starts pushing you from the back, which can dive your nose in on the front and cause you to lose steering or go sideways. Either way is a worst case scenario. Remember that if you are caught on a rough bar coming in, you need to try to keep your boat square with the waves. You want to basically ride the back side of a swell and avoid putting too much speed to where you go over top of that crest. You want to steer clear of the following waves. So I like to have one of my crew members watching out the back and reporting to me how many boat lengths behind the following swell is. Do not allow these swells to catch the back of your boat. When a swell overtakes your stern, it kind of lifts your back end and it has a tendency to want to push your nose in. If the bow of your boat digs into that water, you're going to temporarily lose your steering and as that wave overtakes you, it can tip your boat to the side. If that happens, you need to act very quickly. You need to steer to where it'll straighten you out and get you square with the next waves and then try to stay in front of it. This is a particular challenge on the Columbia River Bar because as we talked before, it's not uncommon to have waves coming from multiple directions at the same time. We might have that swell coming from the west, but if you've got strong winds that are coming from the north or the south, they may create wind chop and wind waves. So while you're trying to keep the stern of your boat square with the ocean swell, you still might be taking some waves from the side from the wind waves. That's one of the challenges of the bar that we're in. The situation can also be different if there is a tide and or wind involved where you will have to quarter the wave. You can be riding the back of a wave like a surfboarder, but on the back side. It will run out from under you and the next one will have you surfboarding, many times at an angle. You will then have to straighten up the boat so that when you are being pushed into the trough of the next wave, you are going straight with the wave. You do not want to be in the bottom of the trough at an angle. The most common thought seems to be, the boat will straighten up soon. Wrong. You will need to power down somewhat. With the normal wave conditions here, you will normally be tipped to the starboard. Your presence should be sharply to steer the starboard under mostly full power, so that the stern is at a 90 degree angle with the oncoming wave. As soon as it passes under you, straighten out and get back on your heading again.
in the event of an emergency, you need to already know how your electronics work. On this particular unit, you're gonna flip that up, you're gonna hit it once, and then you are gonna hold it for three seconds while the screen counts down. Then your signal is sent. Be on channel 16 of our VHF radio. Now, I'm gonna go over this pretty textbook from the way they have it on the Coast Guard website. And here is an example of what that call would look like. Mayday, mayday, mayday. This is Blue Duck, Blue Duck, Blue Duck. Washington number one, two, three, four. Mayday, this is Blue Duck. Coast Guard, we are in the need of assistance near buoy four on the Columbia River bar. We have lost engine power and we are taking on water. Assistance needed is a possible tow assistance as well as pumps. Again, we are taking on water. We have four people on board. That is four persons on board. All are wearing their life jackets. Over. And from there, they're gonna come back and hopefully you can open up that dialogue and they may ask you a few more questions, but that would get the process started. At this point, we've got to talk about worst case scenarios and things to do in the event of a capsizing. In the event of capsizing, if at all possible, stay with the boat. Your odds of getting found are much better if you're near a large object, object like your boat. The Coast Guard says the average boat takes somewhere between 15 and 30 minutes to fully capsize or sink. I personally don't think that pertains to the Columbia River bar. I believe if you are on the ocean or in a lake, it might take that long. Most boats built after 1978 are required to have quite a bit of buoyancy to where even in capsizing, they will either stay afloat on the surface or just below it. But it's an entirely different situation when you've got big waves and swells crashing down on the Columbia River bar. If it's inevitable that you must enter the water, don't jump in. Lower yourself in. And as hard as this may be, you need to try to retain your wits. Panicking will do nothing to help the situation. If you're out in the ocean, there might be help on the way, but it may take a while. Retaining your wits is going to help you also retain your heat, which is very important. Do yourself a favor and go to this website and read through it. There is a lot of helpful hints and advice. All I'm going to be talking about and using in the next couple minutes are highlights. You should read the entire article. The Coast Guard recommends that in the event you are in the water, that you do not attempt to swim unless there's a, a close by object, such as a rescue boat or something there to help you. Rather, you should put your entire focus on retaining your body heat and try to delay the onset of hypothermia. The Coast Guard recommends a position they refer to as HELP position. That stands for the Heat Escape Lessening Posture. And you see that pictured above. A lot of people don't realize that being in very cold water actually hurts. Now, the Coast Guard says the pain will not kill you, but the heat loss will. Here is a chart that shows how hypothermia affects most adults. And this is why we also need to understand the difference between hypothermia and cold water immersion. See, according to this chart, it can take a fair amount of time before you reach full exhaustion or unconsciousness 
and definitely a pretty substantial amount of time before the worst case scenario, before death. However, cold water immersion is something that happens very quickly and has a whole different set of complications. Stage one is cold water shock. Think about when you have ever got into cold water. If you've ever jumped into a cold lake or even a cooler swimming pool, think about how long you took and you stood on the side preparing yourself mentally to jump in. In an emergency with a boat, you may not have that mental preparation. Everything's moving too fast. And so it's gonna react differently than if you stood on the side and prepared yourself. Stage two is swim failure. I hate it when I hear somebody say, I don't worry as much because I'm a great swimmer. This is not about swimming ability. It's about what the water and the cold is gonna do to your body. Stage three is full hypothermia. It usually takes between 15 and 30 minutes to reach this stage. This is where uncontrollable shivering and disorientation really starts to set in. Stage four is called post-rescue collapse. A hypothermic boater is not out of the woods after rescue. Blood pressure can drop to a dangerous low level. Inhaled water can damage tissues in the lungs. It's called dry drowning. Anytime water gets in the lungs, even if you have got it out, it still poses a problem, which is why I stress the importance of understanding the difference between hypothermia and cold water immersion. Cold water immersion causes a shock to the body that makes, it, in a lot of cases, an involuntary gasp happen. The, somebody hits the water and they go <gasps> as if you've ever had the wind knocked out of you picture it like that but if you're submerged in water that's going to fill your lungs even getting the water out somebody performs CPR properly or whatever you still have a huge complication Most fatal boating accidents happen in open motorboats. Most boating fatalities are obviously drowning. Most were not wearing a life jacket. Majority of fatal boating accidents happen in vessels under 26 feet. I know a lot of us run in boats like this. And that doesn't mean we all need to run out and buy bigger boats. It just means we need to understand that it's important to put everything in our favor to make it work. That's what today's video was about. One of my friends in business says it the best. He says, you can have a pet lion, just don't treat it like a cat. As long as we understand what we're dealing with, we can go out there and have a safe, fun experience on our waters. And I didn't mean to end this video on all doom and gloom. But what's really sad is when you think about all of the ways that people have been injured or killed in boating related accidents, it's kind of disheartening to realize that there is one thing that is completely avoidable that has led to more deaths with boating related accidents than any other thing. Alcohol use is the number one cause of boating related accident fatalities. Save it until you get home. Truth be told, I almost never finished this video. 
When I started thinking about the video at first, I thought it sounded like a great idea, and I thought maybe I could put together a 20 or 30 minute video. One thing led to another, and I finally figured that if I was gonna do this, I needed to show it the respect that it deserves and cover as many aspects as I possibly could. I hope it paid off, I hope you enjoyed it. As I mentioned before, as a lot of you know, I don't monetize my videos. I don't put ads on them, I don't clutter them up. That's not my intention of doing this. I hope that eventually, maybe somebody will see my videos and be interested in sponsoring me. Or giving me some kind of sponsorship where I could promote their products. As long as it's something I believe in and that I use, I think that would be awesome. I'm not a licensed guide or anything. I'm just somebody, that, a guy that likes fishing. I'm a guy that really <laughs> likes fishing. Lon Sweeney is the guy that saved five people that were capsized on the Columbia River Bar. And when I was sitting there thinking I had bit more off than I could chew with this video, he had messaged me, he offered help, advice, anything that I needed. And I remember at the end of his message, he says, you know what, I'll do anything I can to help. I think it's great that you're doing this and I think it might end up saving a life or two. And when you really think about that, literally saving a life, that's pretty heavy. I hope all the hard work paid off. I hope you enjoyed this video. Yeah.